So good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. I'm Wen Chi Yu, non-resident fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Thank you for joining us today for a discussion with Dr. Paul Clifford on the second edition of his book, The China uh, Paradox at the Frontline of Economic Transformation. Today's discussion is being hosted by the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation and is co-sponsored by the HKS China Society, a student organization at Harvard Kennedy School. Before I introduce Dr. Clifford, I want to start with a few announcements on the Ash Center's behalf. The Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people in a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Today's event is being recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center's YouTube channel. You're welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the duration of the event. Please send them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead of submitting them via the chat. Now to our feature guest at today's discussion. Dr. Clifford is my fellow fellow at the Kennedy School. The book draws upon his personal experiences to profile the 40 years of China's economic reforms. He first lived in China as a student in 1973 and 74. Later on, he lived and worked in China as a corporate banker, as a strategy consultant and with a US technology company. He has advised Chinese state-owned and private enterprises, as well as multinational firms in China across a wide range of sectors. Dr. Clifford received his PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies and studied at Peking University, has taught at universities in Mexico, the UK, and the US, and published widely on Chinese history, politics, and business. He's also fluent in Chinese Mandarin. I'm particularly excited to speak to Dr. Clifford today because rarely do we hear from people on the ground, with on the ground business experiences in China commenting on today's policy towards China. Even though we know technology is a key area in today's economic com uh, competition narrative. So Dr. Clifford, as the book takes the readers through the 40 years of China's economic uh, transformation through your own personal experience, what is the takeaway for today's audience? Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Wen Chi, so much for moderating this. And also thanks to the Ash Center, to Professor Sage and Professor Cunningham for inviting me. It's a great honor. Um, so, you know, why did, what I, why did I come to write this book, this second edition? Um, first, could I just answer the question, you know, why, you know why, why I came to do a second edition? Why was it necessary? Um, I think a lot has, has changed in the last five years um, since I wrote it in, uh, published it in 2017. Um, on the positive side, I think uh, Xi Jinping has continued to put energy back into the Chinese economy and into technology innovation. Um, and this is, that was after a period of, uh, of, of Hu Jintao in which China seemed to be becalmed somehow with the sails flapping, you know, know what I mean. Um, so in the last five years and starting a little bit before, China has emer finally emerged as a technology innovator after playing catch up uh, for, for so long. And this transformation has sent shockwaves uh, through, uh, through the US in particular, which realized for the first time since World War II, uh, its hegemony might be challenged. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think China in the same period has adopted a much more assertive positioning in the world, abandoning its former, what I would call low key stealth approach. Uh, and essentially it's thrown its soft power out of the window. You know, the wolf warrior concept. Um, domestically, um, you know, there's been a heightened autocracy within China. Um, the communist party sought to reinforce its control throughout the, throughout the, the nation, both in state owned and, and in private sectors of the economy. And another interesting aspect is a very powerful, um, I would think quite toxic uh, personality cult has been built around Xi Jinping. Uh, and Xi Jinping is looking for a third five year term. I think abandoning the, you know, the, the convention of a two term limit 
which had permitted such a smooth succession uh, in the past. So I think in that sense, China's political risk has actually gone up a long term political risk has gone up a notch. Um, and then, you know, on the human rights front, um, China has been, I think, guilty of abuse of human rights, whether in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, or against civil society generally, including the brave civil rights lawyers who, who defend people. And this has become widely publicized worldwide, creating pushback from both left and right, from progressive and conservative. So, um, so China's changed and my assessment has changed. Um, I'm more pessimistic about the long-term future, but the big issue for China is not, is not the economy, in my view, but it's the nation's governance. So that's you know, my take on the last five years. Um, a little long, but we'll have a, I mean, I'm sure we'll be able to answer more concisely in the future. Anyway, why do I want to do this? I mean, this is getting quite personal, but I'm going to keep it not too personal. Um, you know, China's ancient civilization, its poetry, its philosophy, its inventions, its civil service have proven that to be no guarantee of success in the modern world. You know, it's really interesting. And 1949 was a, was a false dawn. So although during the first years of the People's Republic, they built a strong industrial base and there was great progress in healthcare, education and in women's rights, um, the result was very little wealth generation. So, um, so I saw close up um, through the period I've lived in China, which is a long time, um, how after the reforms began in 78, 1978, the Communist Party remarkably and unexpectedly adopted a market-oriented economy as the surest way to maintain power. So that's an equilibrium between entrepreneurial energy and party power, uh, which I call the, power, the China paradox. Um, and that propelled China forward. Um, my concern as I wrote the second edition has been that uh, the delicate balance that had powered China forward in that period is seriously under threat. Um, somehow I think Xi's government feels it may be the time to declare victory in the reforms. I think that would be a huge mistake. So I'm very concerned about the notion of, of China decoupling from the USA. Um, I don't think it's inevitable or, or, or desirable. Um, I, I would say many Chinese intellectuals will tell you that both the US and China are to blame for the current um, frictions with the world. I mean, they, the Chinese commentators I know quietly over a coffee in a remote hotel or whatever, will tell you that, um, that, that China's post WTO behavior, obeying the letters of the agreement, but not the spirit of the agreement and, and the ultra nationalism are in part responsible for terrible relations. But I think the heart of the issue lies in China's rise and its path um, beyond technology ca catch up to actual innovation. And this has provoked a strong reaction. So. Uh, just a few more points. Um, I, I, I strongly oppose the, the, a world, the idea of a world with two camps of technology rivalry. I mean, I think this could be a precursor to kinetic warfare, uh, akin to what happened with, with Britain and Germany before World War I. So, um, you know, I think, I think we all need to be very vigilant. I mean that seriously uh, about China's goals and, and capability and ability. But at the same time, I want to encourage the world to permit China to take its full and legitimate place in the global economy, because I think the alternative is extremely risky and unacceptable. And I want China's internal development to succeed. I do not want China to end up as a, a, failed, a failed state. Okay, rather a long answer, but uh, quite a big question. <laughs> no, that's a really fair point. Uh, we you know, want to see uh, China succeed domestically, um, but we should remain vigilant in terms of its ambitions and goals. Um, and, and I thought what you said was really interesting. Otherwise, the alternative would be too risky and dangerous. Um, what do you think would be the risk and, and danger um, in terms of the alternative. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, and then we can lead to sort of, you know, one chapter um, that you focused on about Huawei in the book, I thought was a, a fascinating uh, sort of uh, personal uh, a recount because, you know, I think in the West, we kind of look at Huawei with certain lens because of the media reporting, as well as what the narratives um, have been out there. Um, but you have provided a more nuanced uh, understanding Understanding it is firsthand. So we'd love to hear from you because um, using that as an example to say, you know, 
are we misunderstanding a lot of things in the meantime? Well, I, I, I often take a nuanced view and I you know, take some flack for that. I have to be careful. careful. Um, um, the, the truth is I've, I've seen Huawei very close up. Um, uh, a little bit over 20 years ago, I was a consultant to them, helping them on their, 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 their design of their business. Um, and then 10 years later, uh, I find my, found myself in a US technology firm doing strategy on China uh, and competing head on with Huawei, which was fascinating. So, so I've seen them you know, in two different senses. Um, I think the central aspect of Huawei today is that it is a national champion in high tech and as such has very strong links with the party state. I think Huawei would do well to stop denying that fact. I don't think it's, it holds any, any um, water really. Um, but much of the rest of the narrative I found is rather flawed and sim or just simply red herrings. Um, you know, uh, thinking about um, the, 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 uh, the, way, the way Huawei competes um, and the, uh, the ownership structure uh, and the, also it's linked to the army. Um, these are, you know, I don't think the, these are the key aspects. I think Huawei's success in part has been due to its relative uh, autonomy that it enjoys compared to SOEs. That doesn't mean it's not connected to the party state, but it's a, that's a nuanced view. Uh, I believe it's true that uh, Huawei began life playing catch up, right? Reverse engineering, imitating, and yes, stealing intellectual property. We know that. But that is not the reason why the US is so opposed to Huawei. Um, the reason is that Huawei has finally innovated and presents a competitive threat. That is the fundamental point, I think. So um, we, interestingly enough, we asked China to be a responsible stakeholder. Do you know that concept uh, in the global economy? Um, and actually, interesting enough, that's exactly what Huawei did. Uh, it participated in the global supply chain, uh, even beyond what I think was prudent. Um, it used Android and did not until recently develop its own operating system for its hands, handsets. And then looking at 5G, it worked with, um, it worked with the global agencies uh, to create a global 5G standard. It did not attempt to create a Chinese standard, something that China once tried with CDMA, CDMA way back and with no success, of course. Um, so I, I think we need to be, you know, Americans and, and the West in general need to be extremely vigilant about letting a Chinese, uh, an autocratic Chinese state um, build our telecoms network. But beyond that, I think we should be not be launching a wholesale attack uh, on Huawei as a firm, including its mobile phone business. I think that's mistaken. Um, I think the attack that's going on against Huawei is part of a broader goal of some people to slow, disable, or contain China's rise. I think that's misguided, dangerous, and will not succeed. China will simply work harder to be self-reliant. So, um, so my message to the US government has been all along, invest to compete. And there is a lot of investment going on in semiconductor, which is great. And, and do not demonize, demonize Huawei. I think that's my message. So I try to keep a balanced view on this. I'm not sure if it works. But. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's always important to have different perspectives. Um, and, um, you know, speaking of Huawei, um, you know, I, I think it's sort of a lot of people, especially in Washington, D.C., with the national security views is that, you know, not so much about the company, but how much the party and the government has the control over the company, especially on national security and even potentially sort of getting into our networks and, you know, the espionage related uh, things. So, yeah, so, so, you know, so, so that goes to sort of the question, the broader question beyond uh, Huawei that is. So how how should we think about Chinese technology companies? So Alibaba uh, is another example that you also recently wrote about and um, the world has watched uh, what's changed uh, with Alibaba over the last two years. So there is a lot of question, right? When a company is very successful uh, technology company that's grown to be 
uh, influential um, and technology um, very well advanced. Um, then it seems that the government, the Chinese government wants to have certain control over it. Um, and what does that mean for the world? How should we think about those companies? Yeah, so do you want to talk about the uh, Alibaba at this stage uh, or more broadly about the state? I think it's more broadly. How do we think about sort of, yeah. you know, the state party yeah. and company relationship? Right, but I, I do have some things to say about Alibaba. And uh, I think, again, that needs to be nuanced because there's a lot of positive stuff going on in technology in China, not just a state takeoff. But um, the, the, the fact of you know, the, the state sector, I mean, if you look at the state, you know, the government and, and the business, I think that's what we're getting at here, um, is a very interesting area of change because, you know, during the, um, in, in the earlier, earlier periods uh, of the reforms, um, the, the, the SOEs and the large companies became not state owned, but state run. And there was a separation of the enterprise from the state. The party, um, you know, did not separate itself from, from the enterprise. Dang Qi, Feng Kai was not, was abandoned really. Um, but at the same time, the party took a, a, a relatively um, soft, uh, used a relatively soft touch with st the state sector and of course with the private sector. Um, and that includes uh, technology firms. But what we've seen recently under Xi Jinping has been a never ending anti-corruption campaign which I think um, actually paralyzes decision making, particularly in the state owned companies. I mean, they are terrified of doing anything. Sometimes it's, it's really debilitating. Um, and uh, um, the party, you know, including in technology firms, I know, and the party has really asserted control over most things. And when I say most things, I mean, that goes from the entire strategic direction of the company down to things such as, you know, bonusing and, uh, uh, New Year celebrations, you know, including the listed parts of the state-owned company, you know, which are, you know, should pay differently, if you know what I mean. Um, the other other thing, big big difference from the past is, which is a positive thing, is that the 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 location for technology R and D and product development has moved away from state enterprise, state um, uh, research institutes, and uh, uh, and gone down to the actual enterprise. That is very positive. So most of the R&D, whether, you know, is even in state-owned enterprise is now done at the producing enterprise. But that said, a lot of the money that's being sent into these technology incentives, a lot of it is just wasted, <laughs> um, goes nowhere. Uh, we've seen that in the semiconductor sector. So, you know, the, the effectiveness of government intervention and support um, is, um, you know, in the larger firms has been um, modest at times and sometimes very, you know, very nothing. Um, but I would stress that from all the things I know and see and hear um, at the smaller firm level, SMEs in the tech sector, that, that she's policies are really driving innovation and change, whether it's access development zones, you know, paying the costs for them to come in and giving seed capital. Um, you know, countless, net, countless private equity firms are now joining that feast of, of, of entrepreneurial spirit, which is going on. So it's a slight contradiction, if you like. There, there are two things going on. Yeah, I, I, actually on that point, I'd love to hear your thoughts further on this because, you know, last year in particular, we saw a lot of what we call the tech uh, crackdown on um, the big Chinese tech companies. Um, and there's a lot of sort of um, speculation that this will actually affect um, entrepreneurs in China in terms of their aspiration to actually start companies as well as growing mm. the companies, right? Um, yeah. And as well as just sort of capital uh, injection into yeah. Um, yeah. In, in the past, you know, very heated uh, market in China. So how do you think about this? Like, do you think the SMEs are still very um, entrepreneurial uh, given what is happening to well, yeah. the big tech companies in China. Yeah, well, I, I you know, I, I've, in, in the last few years, I've visited a lot of SMEs, um, uh, including in technology, in, uh, in the Pearl River district, uh, region of uh, Guangdong, uh, in Zhejiang and parts of Fujian. And 
what I can tell you is that the government, uh, which was usually very, very helpful, has got even more helpful, uh, is behaving more like a US government, supportive but not interfering. And that's really positive. Um, wh what I, I think is happening is that uh, at the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party is extremely efficient and well run in some senses. And it knows that uh, China needs this uh, cutting edge development coming from startups and is doing a really good job of nurturing them. I think the picture that I would paint is that the Communist Party wants to see a dominant state sector uh, in the, you know, the commanding heights uh, of the economy. And when, when SMEs grow large enough and powerful enough, um, they will be slowly assimilated into the state structure. Uh, and this is, I'm not sure if they've articulated it internally, but I, I can see this happening, that there is a stage at which you, when you go beyond so many billion dollars of re revenue or whatever, and, the, the, and if it's highly strategic, you will ultimately be sucked up into the private, larger private firms as you would have in America. <laughs> and then ultimately into the state, uh, sort of the hands of the party state. So I think that there is a, there is, there is a creative aspect to this control. Um, and I, I, what I, does that say to the entrepreneurs? Because every entrepreneur well, wants to grow their company, right, as uh, much as they can. Does that mean yeah. they all have to sort of think about their own strategy will grow the company to, you know, a certain level and then they basically um, have to be prepared to be absorbed by the state um, and government? That absorption doesn't have to be sudden or total. It can be just by, you know, showing showing fealty to the party, you know, going to conferences, you know, becoming a quasi politician a little bit, like Wan Xiang, you know, Lu Guancho uh, did that very successfully in Zhejiang. And a lot has to do with how far you are from the capital, you know. I mean, there's no coincidence these places where the innovation is happening are a long way from Peking, from Beijing. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I. I, I I think that um, many entrepreneurs will will still be heartened by the energy and opportunity there is in China. So I, you know, I, I wrote something on, on China's private enterprises the other day, and I'm getting lots of positive feedback. But also some people saying, well, you know, it's contrary to what I'm hearing, and I, I don't think it's in, it's in conflict with with the, the idea that the SMEs are flourishing and, and technology is. You know, innovation is happening in artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, and Internet of Things uh, at the local level. Uh, so, so I'm really glad that you mentioned those sort of, you know, the the modern technology and and you know, blockchain, 5G, etc., even 6G. Um, the big question now in the narrative of U.S.-China competition or the concern from the West about U.S.-China competition or Chinese companies being too advanced or too innovative is because, you know, there is this chance that at the end of the day, they still need to kowtow and, and you know, basically uh, listen to their government. Um, so in that case, um, you know, when the world is concerned about data privacy and other sort of issues that, you know, people, individuals uh, care about, um, what do we do with them? Um, well, you know, they could be a really advanced company, but, you know, they may be spying on you, right? I think ultimately that's uh, what people here may be more concerned about. Right. Uh, <laughs> um very good question. And, um, you know, I do think Alibaba, the Alibaba question is broader than just, uh, you know, a bit of uh, Qing Li Jiang Dun, you know, uh, clean up and rectify uh, a sector that's underregulated. I think there's a lot of issues um, with, uh, with Alibaba and others being actually uh, too powerful, having too much cash, including offshore, which could threaten the, the communist power base. I think that, that there is, and also a lack of, uh, of deference, you know, from Jack Ma. Yeah. Which was, uh, um, so I think that they will come, become more under control than they are today. Um, and I, I think that, the, you know, the, 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 so much data is, is flowing over these networks. And the, I think the Chinese Communist Party um, already has perfect access, you know, uh, through the law and through, you know, its own its own methods to get to get it. Um, so th there's no doubt that 
but that they, they can get the data, but by actually having more close control over it, including using cryptocurrency on the payment pl platforms, I think um, they will be able to um, see more into, you know, in, into, into, the, uh, into the, the transactions and control things like that. And I don't think that's something we will want to have very much in the West. I mean, the, if you look at the, um, the, the, the social media platforms and the payment platforms in the West, um, I would say uh, most of the intervention is a commercial you know, marketing intervention, where they use your data legally or illegally. Um, in China, you know, and the security forces here um, you know, have to go through some hoops to, to get that data, right? <laughs> um, but in China, that's not the case. And so I think we, we will be very reluctant to permit uh, those platforms to have, you know, full reign over, over in the world. But what I would say is that um, when it comes to e-commerce and, you know, Alibaba, you know, is serving a vast uh, galaxy of of small firms, they call them partners. You know that <laughs> um, they they see them as their ecosystem, and they that includes lots of firms overseas, obviously, because this is international trade. And I think that will continue. I think uh, the e-commerce will be hard to stop because you know business needs it. I mean, U.S. Um, companies need to you know find their bits and pieces, uh, their Christmas decorations for China. They do it through through Alibaba. So, um, but I do think there will be restrictions on uh, Chinese social media in the, in the West um, because, you know, I don't think we can trust the Chinese uh, party state on those aspects. Uh, I don't think the Chinese people do either. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, you know, basically you laid out several really good points, right? So, you know, China's uh, attempt to control their private sector or more specifically technology sector in particular, um, it's not purely just for the sake of national security. Um, there are many reasons and some uh, may be shared actually by a lot of the Western governments. Um, especially regarding antitrust and other issues. That's why um, yeah. we also witnessed over the last year, um, China rolled out a series of regulations on data, privacy, AI, and algor algorithms. Um, it, what's really impressive almost um, is the speed that they roll out those regulations. And um, so do you think China in, in some way is better at regulating big tech than the US and Europe? Um, and, and if so, you know, how so? So this is actually a question from um, our audience, Valerie Tan. Yeah, um, regulating the tech sector. Um, I, I, I think um, China's acutely uneasy about all, all this. I think that deep down, the, the desire is to control. I mean, if you, if you think about China today, um, what, whatever the control for of, what of, purpose of, of society purpose. and business included. Um, you know, if you look at what works in China, what Chinese government wants, whatever serves the party's control, keeps them in power, is the priority, even if it's damaging to business, right? Um, they've done a very good job of balancing control and intervention with, you know, with, with economic freedom. Um, but whenever, whenever um, the the power of the party or uh, any challenges emerge, um, they will they will um, throw the business out of the window. <laughs> um, I give you an example. I mean, I was in Xinjiang in uh, 2009 during the uh, the anniversary, one of the big anniversaries of the People's Republic's founding, and but you know. There was a lot of con the, 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 the local authorities were very concerned about terrorism and about just the general instability in Xinjiang. And what they did was they cut off the Internet. Not just for a week or a month, but for six months. So anybody, any businessman or trader who you know, didn't have any special access uh, to the Internet had to go to Gansu, for instance, uh, to 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 do conduct it, their their e uh, business. So you know that was a very debilitating thing for anybody, not just the tourists like me, um, uh, for, for people in Xinjiang. So I, I think that the regulation um, it, it is about um, it is about trying to avoid large um, 
accumulations of power and influence and monopolies. I, I think there is no contradiction between party power and consumer protection because the consumers are what keep the party in power. The, the Chinese people are very happy with Xi Jinping, mostly, um, as Professor Sage's work you know, validates. Um, so I, I think that the, 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 the party it does look after the people's welfare in that sense. And if there's outrage, for instance, over direct selling, you know, as it was 20 years ago, uh, um, you know, yeah. all sorts of deceptive marketing, the, the, the government steps in very, very quickly and decisively. And, and also to break up monopolies. But you see, it, you know, the, it's a bit like corruption in China. They say, um, to, you know, to get into trouble, you have to be corrupt and be run out of connections. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I, I think it's really important, um, both your work as well as uh, Dr. Sage's work, right, is that what surprises a lot of people in the West, if they don't spend a lot of time in China or trying to understand China, is that generally speaking, I would say the average Chinese um, is OK with uh, Xi Jinping's leadership as well as CCP's. They're not happy, I'm sure. Um, and so even with sort of the recent crackdown on the technology sector, we've seen that a lot of the average people, Lao Bai Xing, um, actually cheer for what the government is doing because they do think uh, the society has be become relatively unfair and you know um, it, it's benefiting uh, the elites more, um, the big businesses rather than sort of the average people. So, you know, that's why it's this kind of common prosperity um, policy, or, you know, I, I would say the term that's been uh, spreading around um, through Xi Jinping's uh, speech and, and, you know, just party propaganda. So how do we think about it, right? On balance, is it harmful or beneficial to China? Um, should it be seen as another uh, reassertion of state party control? And to what extent does it reflect Xi's egalitarian conviction and ideology? Well, so this is a question from our audience, Peter McGill. Yeah, as they always say on the programs, thank you for that question. <laughs> uh, it's actually a good question. Um, very, very to the point. Um, I, I think um, when you talk about any policy in China, uh, it will it will have m many facets to it. And it, they don't have to be propaganda aspects. I, I think there is a general concern about wealth inequality. Yeah. Um, I think they're trying to pull up the interior, this, the smaller third tier cities, which are really rather rubbishy compared to the big cities. You know, we all know that. Um, um, and you know, there is a, a sort of um, resentment against uh, power and authority um, uh, which Xi Jinping has played on, quite yep. uh, dealt yep. with on Absolutely. corruption. Um, so um, while many intellectuals, you know, ab abhor um, things that they see around uh, Xi Jinping, um, the the La uh, the ordinary people, um, uh, actually applaud the, the 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 measures being taken, both externally and internally. But um, I, I I think that uh, the idea that uh, Xi Jinping is a latter day Sort of Mao Zedong driving people to, or, towards communal eating, getting away with the, get, dissolving the, the family and taking wealth away from anybody who has any little wealth, or, you know, uh, as Mao tried to do, uh, is, is actually not borne out by the facts. And I mean, one can look at, I think it was in uh, earlier this, this, this month, um, Xi Jinping gave a quite a telling uh, in. Um, video call uh, to the Davos uh, conference. And in it, he said, um, I, I thought this might come up, so I, I brought it. Uh, he says, um, the common prosperity we desire is not egalitarianism. To use an analogy, we'll first make the pie bigger and then divert, divide it, it properly through reasonable institutional arrangements. As a rising tide lifts all boats, everyone will get a fair share from development and development gains will benefit all of our people in a more substantial and equitable way. Well, that sounds a whole lot like a trickle down economic, economics, doesn't it? And, uh, uh, you know, you, uh, Milton Friedman even. <laughs> so um, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, certainly not egalitarianism and there's no hint of that, um, which is, I think, fascinating because you know, there the, the were hints that 
that, that there was some um, residual nostalgia about Mao. Um, I think in this respect, there is none. It's 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 a it's a really interesting uh, comment that you had because we also saw another question from the audience that uh, was there ever a period when the Chinese ruling uh, apparatus served the common people and not just the ruling elites? Um, you know that obviously is a question for the current uh, ruling elites right now. Um, but um, if you would like to comment on that, uh, that would be great. But if not, you know, we can also move on to the next uh, question. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you, I, I saw that the question came out or shared with me earlier. Um, one of the questions was about, you know, the civicness. Was that the, the question that came up? I think somebody had that question. And, um, and a, a low civicness. Um, I would sort of dispute that actually. Um, I think civil society in China is in its infancy. And actually um, there is some truth in, in what this person's saying. Um, civil society is underdeveloped, uh, local you know, NGOs and foreign NGOs are under great pressure in China. Um, there was, it was the civic society, civil society was, um, was, was flourishing more so you know, 20 years ago. Um, so under Xi Jinping, it's come under, under great, uh, under great uh, stress. But what I would say, there is actually a sort of social contract between the Chinese population and the party state. Um, the social contract is something like you provide, the party state provides stability, um, peace, um, uh, and decent context for our, our living, uh, good policing, you know, all those things. Um, and economic, a reasonable good economic structure, and then the people can get on with their lives, un, you know, un, 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 uninterfered with. Um, but the people in turn accept the party state's authoritarian approach in return for not having chaos in their country. And we know China has in the past been very difficult to govern. So, you know, the, the idea of stability, which is used by the party always, uh, has some meaning to people has some meaning. So, uh, and another aspect of, of this social contract is that people actually do think the party is synonymous with the state in a sense. You know, being patriotic, as the Communist Party keeps reminding them, you know, you can't be patriotic without loving the party or loving you without being, um, you know, loyal to the party. Um, so I, I think the citizens are actually, um, you know, are happy to get jobs, um, healthcare, uh, you know, uh, other things from the state uh, in return for, you know, loyalty to the party. Um, but um, uh, so I, I, I do think, I do think there's more of a, a more civicness, if you like, than people, um, some people might think. Yeah, I apologize. Something just happened to my screen. So my computer had to restart. Hopefully uh, that didn't affect uh, what Paul's, um, uh, response was like, um, um, okay, so um, on, on to another question from the audience. Um, when you say the rights of China should not be checked or in any case such efforts will fail, uh, is not necessary to consider what is the rise, uh, what its rise will mean for its neighbors in the world. That's more of a geopolitical question, I guess. Yeah, and I, I always, you know, in the first book, I steered away from uh, international relations because that's not something I'm that strong on. But I've ha I've had to confront that because, you know, the impact of of, of international uh, uh, the frictions and the, with the world are actually having an impact on, on the economy. So uh, uh, I've looked at that. Um, yeah. So um, the, the question is really, um, you know, how if you are living close to China. Uh, you know, uh, if you're in Taiwan, or if you're in um, you're in Southeast Asia, in the South China Sea, you know, what does it mean? And uh, I, I am very anxious and worried about China's uh, land grab. Also, their continued, you know, um, historic view that they will take Taiwan back by any means necessary. Um, I think that is very threatening. And I think, um, you know, I, I knew this question would come up, and it's a very thorny question. Um, I, 
I would like to see the world stand behind countries that want to resist China's uh, uh, expansion, if you like, uh, in, in the South China Sea. Um, uh, its ambitions to you know, own and control uh, the resources in the, in the South China Sea. Um, I'm not sure that the world is ready to take China on though, unfortunately. Um, I don't think public opinion in the US or in Europe uh, you know, is ready to confront China on this. And I think China is gonna do this very gradually and, and, and quietly. Uh, although it has been noisier recently, you know, with the wolf warrior idea, but uh, I do think that they will continue to put to to exert pressure year by year, um, not just on Taiwan, um, um, but also on the neighboring countries. Um, but you know, I don't think they've agreed on what they want to do either. So, um, and you know, with every changing government in, in Southeast Asia, you get a different view on, on what and how to handle China. Um, this gets to the broader question of China's expansion ambitions around the world. And, and um, at this stage, I, I want to cooperate with China. Uh, I want to see us live with China, even though we may have to hold our nose at times, you know, over human rights or whatever. Um, because I think that's the right way for this time, because China is not yet showing itself to be an imperialist power, okay? Um, it's certainly shifted capital overseas. It's, it's uh, funding many, many projects in Africa and elsewhere. But um, most of the, you know, the only really big place they have a big base is, is Djibouti. But then the French, Americans, and many others have leased military bases in, on that territory. So um, I, I don't think China has yet reached that stage. Although I, I think if I were in Southeast Asia, I would... I, I, I'm not sure how I could, you know, it would be hard to live with. And uh, Yeah, and uh, just on your, on your um, comments just now, I actually do have a question, right? So uh, if we uh, have to collaborate with China, um, because, you know, what they're doing in certain parts of the world is helping investment and uh, uplifting people from poverty, including their own people, right? They, they can certainly share that experience. Um, to the rest of the world. Um, that's the positive side of things. However, ultimately, even you yourself also mentioned, um, as they grow more influential and powerful, um, it's, it's not yet clear what their intentions are and ambitions are and goals are. So if we do anticipate that they may do something more aggressive, um, are, we, are we almost having a conflicting policy um, if we uh -huh. see this coming? Uh -huh. Uh, yes, very, very good. You know, what if I were in power? <laughs> That's what you're saying. What would I be doing? Um, I think, I, th I think that um, China's rhetoric, whether it's you know made in China 25 or, you know, its noises about how great it is and what it can do, uh, are often uh, aspirational, <laughs> as opposed to actual. You know, China still lags in semiconductor very seriously, which is the building block of everything. You know, it's, uh, uh, so in many ways, China's um, continued rise uh, will be constrained not only by technology issues uh, of its own, you know, it hasn't caught up in many areas, uh, but also by its flawed governance, which I point out a lot. So I think uh, China, China's um, profile, profile in the world, um, is growing, but it's not yet a superpower, if you know what I mean. And the other factor is that China, um, you know, if you look at countries that, you know, want room to grow uh, economically or whatever, um, you know, South Korea is a huge export uh, machine. Um, they don't have much of a domestic market to grow anymore. I mean, you know, uh, it's a very advanced economy, uh, uh, South Korea, in terms of electronics, you know, um, uh, use of uh, electronics and uh, uh, it, it's number one in the world in telephony and all that. But China is still, the, the, the urbanization is now in the high, the, the, the low 50s, right? Um, and the, the goal is to go to 70%. What well, that means is that there will be inordinate growth 
in, in China, particularly in the interior and in the second and third tier cities and in the countryside. And that will fuel a lot of growth and give China a place to, um, to develop. Uh, the other thing I would say is that the Belt and Road Initiative, which is like a syn synonym for China's expansion economically and politically, um, uh, is dressed up as a political um, you know, program, <laughs> if you like. But I think it's mostly a, 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 you know, a way of exporting um, uh, industrial capacity developed during the development pro, um, phase. Um, whether it's in cement plants or whether it's uh, um, you know, drilling tunnels through mountains, uh, building railroads, um, that, that is a natural you know, outcome of China's development and it's business driven mainly. That said, it's underpinned by political agreements and cronyism and other things, um, government to government arrangements, China Development Bank, China Exim Bank, all those things, but still, in my mind, it's more of an economic um, program, uh, a business program, if you like, than uh, and or something that's sort of dressed up uh, as a vanity thing for Xi Jinping. Um, so I, I think it's taken on uh, almost for the Chinese. It's a problem. It's so big and powerful that they don't know how to slow it down. Although we, we, it is clear that Chinese banks are slowing down their lending to, to Africa because they're getting horribly mauled by you know, the defaults. So I think yeah. that, 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 so I think that, that China's positioning in the world is A, misunderstood and far less dramatic than people um, make out. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's been a lot of sort of debate about, you know, what China's ultimate intentions are and, you know, its own philosophy, right, when it comes to governance and its relationship with people. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to sort of um, dwell on those more philosophical questions, but, you know, there's a question that's really good from the audience. Um, how, how do we think about the social bond, uh, social contract between the Chinese government and the Chinese people and whether it will be stable in the long run? Um, and do you think this contracting bond will be tempered when China's economic growth slows down? Um, and how it, do you think the Chinese government can develop a similar social contract with people in Taiwan? Uh, that's a question from Alice Zhang. Well, um, I'll start with the easy one, um, the, 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 the Taiwan bit. Um, I, I think it's highly unlikely that China will convince the Taiwanese that, um, that they want to live in Xi Jinping's China. You know? um, I just can't see it happening. Um, you know, it's been a democratic part of China for a long time now. It's proven it can do it. Uh, it's successful. Um, it's TSMC, I think has 65% uh, of the world's uh, chip uh, capacity, you know? I mean, this is a, 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 a huge giant. They're linked, of course, to China through economic means, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in engagement. Um, but still, uh, I, I can't see uh, that social contract working, just because really the one country, two systems uh, idea uh, um, was, I think, designed mainly for Taiwan, actually. Um, it failed in Hong Kong, where it had no chance of success because it's right up against China. But they hoped that to persuade by having the convergence in the opposite direction to what we have in Hong Kong today, between, you know, towards Hong Kong system in China, that finally maybe Taiwanese people would say, I don't want to, I, I, would, I would live under the Communist Party, um, but that's out of the window, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> so I, I don't see the, the, the social con contract extending to, to Taiwan. Um, the China, uh, th this is a really, the question of growth uh, is really important and I don't see, I, of course, China's growth is slowing down, but so the economy is so much larger. So the growth part is still enormous. Um, but more importantly, I mean, China, China under even under Hu Jintao and now under uh, under Xi Jinping have really determined that uh, they need to go for good growth, you know, good GDP, not just uh, a number, because it created so many problems. So social yeah. welfare problems, yeah. but also you know, environmental issues. So yeah. they're going for a better, greener sort of GDP, which I applaud. They're also trying to 
uh, upgrade smaller cities, not just create mega megapolises, um, which which have their big issues. So I, I think that uh, the, the the China's the growth, even if it slows quite a lot, will not lead to a severing of that bond between the Chinese people and the party. But uh, there are risks. Okay, um, you know m- most Chinese don't have stock stocks. I mean, the stock market isn't important as it, unlike in the United States, where quite a lot of people feel they, they, you know, they, they need to watch the stock market. What is really important to Chinese people is their real estate. And many people have more than one, you know, a lot of people have more than one, even three flats. My, my, my driver, I think, has three apartments now, my former driver. Um, uh, and this is where the, the Chinese people's wealth is. And of course, uh, if property you know, property prices were to fall. They have in places, of course. Um, that could, could, could cause harm, but it's very hard, very difficult to look at any country as large as China without disaggregating it. I always say to people, we have to cut it into pieces and look at it regionally and in a city by city. So if you look at Beijing, Shanghai, you know, I mean, even with a decline, uh, sort of a, a, a tough economy, um, real estate still quite, quite you know, it's really expensive there. Um, in some some other places, and I can I can speak for places like Chongqing, um, uh, where you know there was there is massive building and construction, um, w- which may not get finished in many of those areas. Um, um, there, you will see a different sort of situation where you might find um, you know property prices um, not holding up. So I think th- there are real threats to to. The, the bond, but it will take a lot to sever that because as I say, the Chinese people are mindful of just how ungovernable China has been in the past. And will, uh, you know, they, 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 they can tolerate a lot of, uh, of bad governance. And the way I see it is that the people, uh, the people I know uh, at the local level, they, 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 they know which bad official in the city has built uh, illegal structures on their on their roof. You know, they know who is corrupt, and they go off. They, there's a lot of feeling about corrupt officials, but that doesn't usually extend to the party as a whole. People think, well, the party can you know can handle it, and uh, so, I, um, I, I, the, the, so the the party. I just want to say the party is it depends on the party isn't a feat or crumbling. It's in a pretty good shape and the 90 million people in it. Um, and I think it's, you know, able to, um, to, to, you know, to change somewhat. Uh, my concern is that it's actually going back in some ways in its social purpose, uh, going back to an older model, which I think is not helpful. Yeah, I think the, you know, lesson learned probably is that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, um, for the sake of its own survival, um, is trying to be uh, flexible and agile as well to adjust its governance style. Um, And right now, I think the common prosperity uh, policy pretty much says, you know, again, the party and state feels that perhaps uh, the inequality and uh, wealth distribu- uh, distribution hasn't been as equal as it uh, proclaims. So uh, it's trying to have a policy to make people feel and believe that, you know, party state um, is ultimately, you know, the right um, uh, sort of leadership right now. Um, so I, I, I agree with you uh, to a larger extent, but I also believe that um, some people say this kind of theory underestimate, you know, sort of Chinese people's aspiration for a freer and more democratic system. Um, but, you know, again, really, let's not <laughs> draw on the but, philosophical but, debate but, right now. But Wang Chi, I, you know, I, I think that there's plenty of middle ground between, you know, freedom and democracy and what China has today, plenty of middle ground. You know, it took, it took Mexico, you know, 80 years to go from one party to two party, you know, uh, uh, although it's not very comparable. But I, I, I think that the, um, the, 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 the party, you know, can, could evolve and has evolved and, uh, um, and you know, understands, you know, the, the dynamics of the situation. My concern is that, um, and, and yeah, my concern is that Xi Jinping um, you know, is, has defaulted to a harder, tougher you know, control thing rather than more loosening up. Um, I mean, that is his reaction to the risk of, you know, of, of, of social fragmentation. 
Um, so I, the, the, but the, Ch the Chinese people, um, uh, I think, need and want more transparency and accountability. The, the idea of the Communist Party you know, running the country is one thing, but having essentially a secret society running the country, um, you know, um, the way it does it is not helpful. And people regularly you know, are very, very frustrated at the way the party handles things. You know, the party is perfectly capable of cleaning up a mess and resolving a problem. What is not good at doing is actually stopping things happen in the first place, whether it's explosion in Tianjin <coughs> or, or the SARS outbreak or, 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 or the yeah. COVID outbreak. Uh, COVID, but, one, yes. but a sign that it's not a feat or in, on the, in its death throes is that usually it can clear up and make things happen. I, I was participated in the in the rescue and, and, and rebuild of, of Sichuan after the one China earthquake. I was there very actively. And you know, one of the things that was apparent was of course, the houses that collapsed and killing all the children, the schools that collapsed, were, were substandard, and that was clear. But also, there were no helicopters. Uh, China did not have the helicopters to get in for the early rescue. But once, you know, so there were you know, defects in their whole, the way they handled it, the way, the way it worked. But very, very quickly, there were huge deployment of troops throughout the place, and each state, each sorry, each province of China was allocated a, an affected county or city in, in Sichuan. So they got their act together. And I think they can do that very, very efficiently. And the people know that. Um, and I think they're willing to stick with it um, more than we would think. But uh, there, there are, but there still are risks. And I just think that China could do with more of that transparency and more of that accountability um, and without actually giving up power. You see, I think that's you know, perfectly reasonable and it would make the whole economy and whole system you know, much smoother and more efficient. Yeah, um, I think for us in the West, it's harder for us to imagine that there could be a more effective governance uh, system um, than democratic system. But uh, I remember, um, you know, reading someone saying actually from uh, Harvard that um, the Chinese people look at, you know, effective governance. Uh, so if the government can respond to their demands and uh, solve their problems, they're happy with that. And, and it doesn't matter what the actual system is, whether it's the current Communist Party ruling or its democratic system, right? To them, it's all about solving their problems. Right. Um, that, that, that's another interesting one. But in the interest of time, we only have two minutes left. I think I so appreciate your um, sort of, you know, analyzing what's happening in China right now, in particular, sort of the business economic sector, um, as your book, you know, says it's China paradox. So what are some of the final words you have for our audience today? Well, um, <laughs> um, I, I think it's about time we had a nuanced view about China. Uh, I think the, the dangerous aspect of the current situation uh, it, with in relation to China is that there's no room for, um, you know, the, no, little room for compromise. I mean, we we use word, very extreme words to describe what's going on, and uh, as I said, left or right, progressive or conservative, you will find a lot of people in the West who who really are tired of China. I think that's a shame because actually China never intended to become like us. Um, I've been telling people that forever. They they want to they find their own path. Um, and it may be not, it isn't pretty at times, and it's very repressive. And to back to your point, and of course, the Chinese people, um, broadly speaking, uh, do support their, their, their party and their state. But, uh, you know, I would measure a decent country by the way they treat their minorities or their dissidents. And the way that is happening in China is uh, egregious and awful, and it makes me you know, very, 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 uh, very unhappy. So um, the, 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 the future of relations is very, and as I said, we, 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 I, I do believe we, we can uh, occasionally and need to actually have sanctions against some Chinese companies uh, who get involved in, in human rights abuses. But I don't think a, an all out try to bring China down, try to contain China uh, philosophy is right or suitable. I don't think China is a threat to world peace at this stage. 
Um, it is not pretty it, domestically, but I think we have very little choice but to collaborate with China as far as possible. And, and so I think the, the notion of China being an adversary, China being a competitor, and China being a, a, a collaborator or cooperator is important, but we have to put some content into the collaboration. And um, I, am gr I think that on the technology side, it's really hard to do to, to, to find areas, but I do think there are areas we can, we can, we can work on. China is, I think we should start the, the, the strategic economic dialogue with China that was started by Reagan and continued by, by Obama. I think that under that program, there was the thorium salts nuclear program, the Oak Ridge Laboratory of the United States collaborated with China on, that's still continuing believe it or not. And I think there's room in biotech and artificial intelligence for, for, for the medical diagnostics and many other areas and, and you know, on climate change, but way beyond um, uh, uh, Senator Kerry's uh, uh, brief. I think there's lots of things to be done. And I think they can be done largely by companies, but you know, Chinese and foreign and American companies, but under some sort of umbrella that the US brings. And I would love to work on some of those pilot projects. I think that that would help diffuse the situation and bring China out into the world rather than drive, driving it into its skin, which is, yeah. I think is a shame. Well, thank you so much for the session today. And uh, please do for the audience, you know, um, if you could, you know, get a copy of the China Paradox. Um, it's a very quick read. Um, for me, yeah. it's just one day um, yeah. and I finish everything. Uh, fascinating. So um, on behalf of Ash Center, this is the reason why we provide such platform to help people understand the world better, especially China and Asia. Um, as the U.S., you know, sort of tackles and, and tries to understand how can we um, exist in a world where China is increasingly uh, playing a more important role. But thank you so much um, for you, joining Wanji. us. And this session will be posted on YouTube for a playback if you're interested in sharing with your network or would like to watch it again. Uh, thank you so much for joining us.